Hello, and welcome back to Elder Sign, a weird fiction podcast by Clay Temple Media. I'm Glenn McDorman. And I'm Brandon Buddha. This episode, we're talking about the M.R. James uh, story, Lost Hearts, originally published in Pall Mall Magazine in 1895. I am a huge M.R. James fan. A lot of these stories were written, or, or at least originally written, for oral performance. And I've read them aloud at campfires with my niece and as part of a ghost stories at Christmas afternoon with my in-laws. So I'm glad we're getting to James right away here in the podcast. Uh, And this story in particular occupies a large place in my imagination. Uh, And I think it's also been influential in our pop culture, including the infamous Thanksgiving episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I really enjoyed this story. This is my first introduction to James. I really love his narrative style. It's important, I think, for our listeners to know who aren't reading this, though it can be found for free online on in a number of sources, that it is a uh, first-person narration, and it is clearly meant to be read aloud, though our recap will feature uh, very little of the narrator, except when we have to break in. James is not playing games with there being a narrator. This is a story to be told in the dark. Well, on that note, Brandon, why don't you take us through the plot of Lost Hearts? It is September in the year 1811. A little boy, whose name we learn is Stephen Elliott, arrives alone at Azerby Hall as an evening light shines on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. The evening is pleasant, but tinged with the sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn. The opening of this story is pretty visually evocative. There's a huge amount of architectural detail in the very first paragraph. This is something M.R. James is famous for. He loved architecture, I think, secretly always wanted to be an architect, I think much like George Costanza and Seinfeld. (laughs) And so there's some beautiful description here, but it's, it's not just beauty for beauty's sake. We get some really strong emphasis, some foreshadowing of what the themes are going to be. As you said, Brandon, the windows of the house glow like fires, which I think is real hellish imagery. Uh, We're also told that the clock is striking six as our narrative begins. And of course, that is a hellish number. And we're also told that the church tower is obscured by trees, right? There's a, a note that the church is neglected and uncared for. And this is going to turn out to be a story about a man who is failing to be a good Christian, who is neglecting his Christian obligations to others, to the world, to himself. What's fascinating, as we'll find out, is that by all appearances, he is a model Christian. We learn this in part because Stephen Elliott, the boy, is an orphan, and he had become orphaned six months ago. Now, Mr. Abney, the resident of Azerby Hall, is his cousin, is Stephen's cousin, and he is very graciously offered to take Stephen in. This is unexpected because Mr. Abney has a reputation for being reclusive. Mr. Abney does not have a clear profession in this story, though he's well known in academic communities. The narrator lets us know that the professor of Greek at Cambridge knows Mr. Abney by reputation, that he's very knowledgeable in the religious beliefs of the later pagans, and that his library contains books on the mysteries, Orphic poems, and the worship of Mithras and Neoplatonists. Mr. Abney's home even includes a statue or some decorative ornament, it could be a a recovered boss relief perhaps, of a group of Mithras worshippers slaying a bull. And because he's so wrapped up in his scholarly pursuits and his books, many of his neighbors are surprised by the fact that he even had a young cousin or any family to begin with. Yeah, we didn't do this on purpose, but Mr. Abney actually works on the same field that I do during my day job as a late antique and early medieval historian. We're going to be talking about some of these things that Mr. Abney studies later on in our discussion, but mentioned here are the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Orphic Cult, and the Mithras Cult, in addition to Neoplatonists, all of which is is very, very cool. Uh, If you're into that sort of thing, or if you become into that sort of thing when we get into our discussion, I think we should also mention that uh, we also do a podcast on the history of late antiquity and the Middle Ages and the Byzantine period called Agnes. I interview other scholars about their research. I release episodes about once a month, and I think it's worth checking out. Yeah, I highly recommend it. It's it's a fantastic 
podcast. Mr. Abney greets Stephen with delight at the door and immediately asks him his age. Mr. Abney tries to backtrack a little bit by saying that he meant by asking his age that he hoped the boy wasn't too tired to eat. But this kind of backtracking only calls attention to the question, which he returns to immediately. We learn that Stephen is 11 years old. He's going on 12. After you know, these brief introductions are made. Mr. Abney pawns Stephen off on his housekeeper, Mrs. Bunch, who is a delightful woman who can see Stephen's curiosity about the house and grounds. Abney also instructs his butler, Mr. Parks, to bring Stephen tea or whatever he desires. Well, Stephen is very curious, and he wants to know who built the temple at the end of the Laurel Walk, and who's the old man in the picture hanging in the stairwells who's sitting at a table with a skull under his hand? And Mrs. Bunch is able to answer these questions to Stephen's satisfaction, um, and though Stephen has other questions, these are, these are the ones she has satisfying answers to. Um, but this sort of back and forth and, and this kind of type of conversation occupies much of their time together in the coming months. Well, the story jumps ahead to November, and Mrs. Bunch and Stephen are sitting by the fire in Mrs. Bunch's rooms where they spend a lot of time. And Stephen's curiosity reaches out to Mr. Abney. He asks Mrs. Bunch if Mr. Abney is a good man, if he'll go to heaven. Mrs. Bunch is ecstatic in her reply. She says that Mr. Abney is one of the kindest souls who ever lived. And his kindness is demonstrated in the fact that before he took in Stephen, he had taken in two other children, presumably orphans. One was a boy and one was a girl. This was not at the same time. These were two incidents in the past. It must be stated, though, that both of them left Azerby without notice. And Again, Mr. Abney's concern and gentility and kindnesses was demonstrated by how broken up he was about these disappearances, particularly the girls, so much so that he even had the lake dragged. But Mrs. Bunch is sure that the girl left because there was some gypsy blood in her. Besides, there was singing around the house for as much as an hour the night that she went. So she doesn't know. She thinks maybe the girl hid and then ran away. This is the first lesson of horror literature. If you go someplace and discover that several other people in your demographic have gone mysteriously missing, never to be found, or their bodies recovered, you should just leave. Right. It's better to be an orphan at this point because you'll have a chance to live. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So there's some really great stuff going on in the buildup to this information that is all getting at this theme of of what it means to be a good Christian. On the estate grounds, as you pointed out, there is a a temple at the end of a walkway created by laurel trees. And this is a pagan temple, laurel trees, laurel leaves, very important in Mediterranean, ancient Mediterranean religions. And James doesn't call much attention to it, but it seems to me that Mr. Abney is so into his studies that he has built a place in which to practice the religion of the people that he is studying, right? So it's not just that he's neglecting Christianity by not caring for the church on his grounds. He's abandoned Christianity in favor of another religion. And we then immediately get Stephen asking if Mr. Abney is a good man and whether or not he will go to heaven. And this is a narrative device, right? As we've seen to get Mrs. Bunch talking about these other children who've gone missing. But I think it actually is an important question of the story itself. And it is also perhaps Mr. Abney's own question about the nature of the universe, which is to say that while he doesn't subscribe to Christianity's method for achieving eternal life, we are going to see that he maybe has some other methods for doing that. If our listeners haven't, haven't been able to figure it out so far, they are not really great methods, but we'll find out more about that. So as I said, the girl had gone missing and maybe she ran away with a gypsy tribe even though they heard her in the house the night after she the night she disappeared and here we learn a little bit about the boy who went missing he was a foreigner and the narrator points out that mrs bunch recognized that the that mr abney was interested in the boy's age and where he was from he asked the same sorts of questions he asked stephen and that's to demonstrate his generosity of soul in mrs bunch's mind 
But the boy just up and left one morning, and he left his hurdy-gurdy behind. This information is just too much for Stephen to sit on. He's a curious child. So he spends the rest of the evening cross-examining Mrs. Bunch and trying to get the hurdy-gurdy to play. That night, after Stephen learns about these missing children, he has an odd dream. He finds himself in his dream at the end of the passage, at the top of the house where there's an old disused bathroom. The upper half of the door to the bathroom was glazed, and there used to be an old muslin curtain that hung over it uh, to cover the view into the bathroom, but that had long since gone, and so it was easy to look through the glass. So Stephen looks through the glazed glass, and with the help of a bright moon, he sees a figure laying in the bath. The figure had the features of corpses, which had been dead for ages, but prevented from decay. It was wrapped in a shroud, and their hands were pressed tightly against the region of their heart. And as he's gazing upon this ghastly figure, a low, almost an audible moan issued from the lips, and the arms began to stir. The image terrifies Stephen, and he wakes up only to discover that he is, in fact, standing in the hallway in front of the bathroom door. And the narrator points out with that with courage, not common among boys his age, Stephen checks to see if there indeed was a body in the bathroom. And there is not. So Stephen returns to bed. Yeah, he's not just curious. He's also extremely brave. And these stories are really meant to be consumed by children. That's why there's a child protagonist in this story. And he's really being held up here as a model for the young audience to aspire to. He is someone who wants to know about the world, who is curious and is thinking about his surroundings, but who also is not afraid of them. Uh, He approaches life with both bravery and curiosity. Uh, I I think we all wish we would be that way more. Well, what happened to Stephen really freaked him out. And he tells Mrs. Bunch the story the next day, and she replaces the muslin curtain on the glazed glass in the bathroom. But he also tells Mr. Abney this nightmare. And Mr. Abney shows great interest in this story as well. So much so that he makes some notes in his book that he carries with him. The winter passes without incident, and now the spring equinox is approaching. Mr. Abney is given to reminding Stephen frequently of this fact, as it was considered by ancients to be a critical time for the young. Yeah, I think he really means dangerous here. (laughs) Right. He instructs Stephen to take care of himself and to shut his bedroom window at night, which is always good advice, I suppose. Yeah, really, you should do that all the time, not just at the spring equinox. (laughs) Right. Well, around this time, the time... Leading up to the spring equinox, two odd things happen to Stephen. The first occurs after the morning of a difficult night of sleep without dreams. His nightgown has been shredded on the left side of his chest. And he gives this to Mrs. Bunch to mend. And she wants to know how Stephen had managed to tear his nightgown this badly. But he doesn't have an explanation. He does, though, notice that the tears on his nightgown match the scratches outside of his bedroom door and he definitely had nothing to do with those and mrs bunch doesn't have an explanation for that either and she suggests that Stephen lock his door before going to bed and not tell anyone <laughs> right yeah well who's there to tell <laughs> well, well his cousin i i guess mr abney <laughs> right right <laughs> but this is not this is not solid advice if you have evidence that you've been assaulted in your home during the nighttime. You should not just double lock your door. You should really tell someone. Right. At this point, his only instructions from the helpful adult is to lock your window and lock your door and hide in your room. Yeah. These are not helpful adults at all. No, no, they are not. The next evening, as the equinox looms over the story, Mr. Parks barges into Mrs. Bunch's room where Stephen and Mrs. Bunch are engaging in their typical nighttime conversation. Mr. Parks is flustered, and he's acting out of character. He tells Mrs. Bunch that he is not going to the wine cellar at night anymore, and he doesn't know if it's rats. He's heard 
tales about rats that can speak from the shipyard or if wind is blowing through the tunnels, but somebody or something was speaking down there at the far bin and it is not something he wishes to experience ever again. Mrs. Bunch at this point points out that Stephen is in the room and this sort of talk will terrify him and Parks immediately walks back his statement because he just didn't right realize that Stephen was in the room and he tries to play it off as a joke, but it's clear to Stephen that Parks heard voices in the wine cellar. These adults are utterly incompetent, and Stephen is too clever for them, for all of them, really. But I love Parks. Parks criticizes Mr. Abney here for only getting drunk at night, while he himself, of course, prefers to get drunk in the afternoon like a sensible person. Right. There's a lot of class kind of shadows that that are cast over this story as well. One of the reasons why Stephen is able to be more intelligent or outwit these characters is because he's of uh, a higher class. He's part of Abney's family, even though he's being taken care of by the help. James, through the use of dialect, does point out that these characters are uneducated. They're from a different class of society. And so they're given to these sorts of superstitions and the the stories that travel through these classes, which is, you know, a great hallmark of this kind of late Victorian era writing is that there's, there's a sort of cant among the lower classes where that they use to communicate. And what James is really emphasizing here is the dearth of intellect in the lower class, but also the dearth of morality in the upper classes. And Stephen is this boy who is straddling both of these worlds and is going to come out the other end uh, better for it. Before we get into the next section, I actually want to give a note that I think will clue readers into some of the things that they might want to be thinking about while you're recapping it, Brandon. James says that we have now arrived at March 24th, 1812, and there are a number of interesting things going on with this date that he does not explicate in the text at all, but which his original audience would have been well aware of. For one, this was New Year's Eve in the medieval calendar. Um, And in fact, it was New Year's Eve uh, in the English and the American calendar all the way up until 1750. And this date coincides with the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th. That would have been New Year's Day. The Feast of the Annunciation is a Christian holiday that celebrates the announcement to the Virgin Mary by the angel Gabriel that she's going to give birth to Jesus, to the Savior, who will bring the gift of eternal life to humanity, Uh, a theme that's going to be important in just a page in which we've been pointing out already. Uh, But this date also places the action of our story in Holy Week, that is the, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter, with Easter falling on March 28th in 1812. So March 24th, the the day this is all going down, uh, was a Wednesday. And the Wednesday of Holy Week is the day when Judas Iscariot launched his plan to betray Jesus for his own personal gain. Uh, This will also become a theme here. And indeed, while Judas Iscariot was given 30 pieces of silver for that betrayal, uh, we're going to actually see some silver coming up next in this scene. Absolutely. And as you said, Glenn, it is March 24th, which means the equinox has passed. And this is also a bit of a relief of tension. It seems like the story is leading up to something happening on the equinox. And this is just this mild release. Uh, he made it through safely. But now is where the real trouble begins. Yeah, I mean, it's it's masterful storytelling. It's really brilliant. Well, this day is a windy and noisy day. And everything from the house to the gardens gives a restless impression. After lunch, Mr. Abney requests that Stephen join him in his study at 11 o'clock that evening. And there's no need to let anyone know because it's a private matter which concerns Stephen's future life. Don't do it, kid. Just don't go. (laughs) Right. Well, this development excites Stephen. I feel like his life has been a little mundane, a little tedious, a little quotidian, and he's excited for a new mystery. But as he's passing the library on his way to his room before bed that night, where Mr. Abney told him he should wait until 11 o'clock, he notices a brazier that has been moved to a new place in the room and a silver gilt cup filled with red wine and some sheets of paper. And Mr. Abney is engaged in the action of sprinkling incense on the brazier from a silver box. And he's so engaged in these activities and setting this up that he doesn't notice Stephen as he passes by. At 10 o'clock that evening, 
Stephen looks out his window. And from time to time, as he's gazing out in the countryside, he hears strange cries emerging from the woods. Cries that he can't identify with any of the country sounds that he's become familiar with. The sounds are getting closer, and Stephen, becoming unsettled, thinks he should just close his window and continue reading Robinson Crusoe. But just as he thinks this, just as he's about to act, two figures appear on the gravel terrace that runs alongside the garden side of the hall. The figures are those of a boy and a girl, standing side by side, looking up at the windows. And the girl immediately recalls the figure in the bath to Stephen's mind, and the boy fills him with fear. The girl is standing with her hands over her heart, and the boy wearing ragged clothing raises his arms with an appearance of menace and unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shines almost through the boy's hand, as though his hands are translucent, and Stephen notices that the nails are long. On the left side of the boy's chest is a gaping rent, and his mind, and in his mind, not his ears, Stephen hears the cries he heard just moments before. The figures move away silently, and Stephen saw them no more. This puts Stephen in a, a real conundrum here. It seems like James is really advocating that the thing that Stephen ought to do is, in fact, stay in his room and read Robinson Crusoe or any number of other good books that are edifying to boys his age. But faced with seeing these ghostly kids outside, it's not really clear that staying in his room is going to be the safe thing to do. So I think really James here is advocating not that children should just stay in their room and play things safe and do what they're told. He's really emphasizing Stephen's ability to observe the world around him, to come to conclusions about it, and to adapt to those circumstances and make good choices. As in many great horror stories, the lesson is often that you can't hide yourself away from the nightmares of the world. And even if you close your window and lock your door and do everything right, there's still a chance you'll be intruded upon. And the real lesson is to learn how to make right actions in the face of these sorts of things, rather than finding a better place to hide. With nowhere really to go and no place feeling safe, Stephen takes his candle with him and heads out to Mr. Abney's studies. He's scared because of what he just saw. And he moves through the hallways quickly. And I love this image. I mean, who hasn't run up the basement stairs or run from their room to their parents' room after a nightmare? You know, this is just a great image. When he reaches the door, he finds that it doesn't open. And it's not that the door is locked. It's just impossible to budge. And Stephen is pounding on the door. And he thinks he can hear Mr. Abney crying out. Has, has Mr. Abney seen the children too? Suddenly, things go quiet, and the door yields to Stephen's efforts. What Stephen finds in the room will have to wait a moment, as our narrator breaks into the action of the story to describe the papers in Mr. Abney's office, which would take Stephen some time to understand that would give him a full comprehension of these events. We learn, maybe unsurprisingly, that Mr. Abney was intrigued by a belief held by the ancients regarding the means of achieving spiritual ascendancy above common mortals, eternal life, immortality. There's a bit of a spell and a potion required to achieve this. The ingredients of this ritual include three hearts of children removed while the child is still alive and reduced to ashes. The ashes are to be mixed with port, preferably, and drank down. And the best time for the ritual is around the spring equinox. Mr. Abney plotted the best way to find these children. It was best if they were children that no one would notice has gone missing. And his cousin Stephen, after becoming orphaned, was an impossible opportunity to pass up. Now, Mr. Abney is aware of the risk of psychic disturbance of ghosts, especially as he plans to hide the bodies in a disused bathroom or the wine cellar. 
but the ghosts will have no power over him once he completes his ritual. Neither will human justice be able to reach him. And tonight, he was preparing to take the final heart from Stephen. This is a, a pretty classic bit of exposition about what the villain of the story has been up to the whole time that we've been getting our narrative from the point of view of the victim uh, who is doubling as our protagonist here. It's maybe a little bit silly to kind of get the explanation in the form of a journal entry that we discover conveniently at the end, but James is having fun with this. He repeatedly, up to this point throughout the story, is telling us that Mr. Abney loves to write things down in his book. James himself is making fun of this idea, but this is actually some really gripping stuff that's going on here that Mr. Abney is up to, and we're going to unpack some of that in our discussion. There's just a couple things I want to point out here, which is that in this journal entry, Abney mentions three important late antique figures or, or texts that would have been important in late antiquity. Uh, one is, is Simon Magus. Uh, the other is the Clementine Rogations. And then there is Hermes Trismegistus. And we'll talk about all of those when we get to the discussion. Yeah, I really can't wait for the discussion of this story because it's, it's such a fun story and there's so much cool stuff in it. So now we learn what Stephen finds as he enters the library. Mr. Abney is in his chair. His head is thrown back, and his face is stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. A lacerated wound on the left side of his body was deep enough to expose the heart. And there's no blood in the room. There's no blood on any instrument in the room, nor on Mr. Abney's hands. And as the window was open, the county coroner is of the opinion that a wild animal must have gotten in to the office and attacked Mr. Abney. But Stephen and the readers, having read the papers, are led to a very different conclusion. And this is how the story ends. Well, on that chilling end and narrow escape, let's get into our discussion. There are three big categories of things I want to talk about regarding this story. Uh, the first of them is world building and the metaphysics of James's ghosts really unpack how this world works. The second thing is going to be about religion and in particular about Mr. Abney's religion as well as Mr. Abney's villainy. And the final thing is going to be on the topic of knowledge. But let's begin at the beginning with the world building and the metaphysics of James's ghosts. My first question is, is Mr. Abney working alone or has he actually formed a mystery cult with several adherents here in rustic Lincolnshire? My evidence for this, or at least what I think suggests this as a possible reading, is that there's this temple on the grounds, but also the singing and the calling in the woods this, that's associated with the murder rituals. I don't really understand what that singing is all about if it isn't other adherents to these pagan religions. Right. One thing I guess I didn't mention clearly is that the, there is singing in the house, but there is also singing in the, in the woods. And uh, to make it explicitly clear, the singing in the house is uh, the girl singing from the, from the unused bathroom after she's been murdered. Her spirit is calling out. The singing in the woods is ascribed to the gypsies that Mrs. Bunch and Mr. Parks think uh, st stole the girl away. I'm not given to the notion that there has that Mr. Abney has formed a mystery cult, and this is because M.R. James, as a narrator who is a trustworthy narrator in this story, lets us know that his neighbors don't even really know much about him. So, if he has formed a mystery cult, it is not with the residences of Lincolnshire. It's not with people who the narrator, like a good you know, interviewer or journalist would go out and get this information from. I think Abney is a wealthy, lonely man who is putting up a facade and hiding much of his life and is doing this for himself. He is a very deeply selfish man uh, who has n really lost his way. And so I don't think there, a mystery cult has formed around him or his rituals. Yeah, I agree. Everything about Abney and the way that James describes him suggests lonely man with too much money and not enough human community. But what do you think that the noises from the woods on the days of these murders actually are then? 
yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of this kind of calling from the woods that we that we get from the story from Mr. Park's experience after the girl has gone missing. It could be anything um, in the, maybe the same way that Mr. Parks hears uh, voices in the cellar. Maybe he has a real sensitivity to this sort of thing. And maybe there have been other murders on this ground and he's just sensitive to those voices. These spirits do get together in this story, though the boy and the girl are explicitly the ones that are together. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. I don't either, and I'd, I'd love to hear what listeners have to say about this on the, the, the forums, but one of the things that I was considering is that these noises, this singing and calling in the woods, has to do with the spiritual forces, the, the magic that Mr. Abney is doing as he's prepping for the, the murderous rituals during the course of the day. That would be my best guess, but really no idea. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think we see explicitly spirits rising as he's performing these rituals um, and as he's preparing for, for this kind of dark rite. But it could also just be something that's really spooky. Well, on the topic of spooky, let's talk about ghosts. I want to catalog the characteristics of the ghosts in this story to see if we can make sense of how they work, what the rules of ghostliness are in this story. So, Brandon, what were some of the things that you observed the ghost doing here? Well, we have them calling out to the people of the house for recognition that they've been murdered. This happens to Stephen and it happens to Mr. Parks. So we have that disturbed psychic presence. We have them maybe trying to warn Stephen, though ineffectively, and maybe scaring him more than he needs to be scared by scratching at the door and by tearing his night clothes in the place where his heart will be removed. We have the fact that they only make themselves visible at the night of the murder, that there's some psychic upheaval that evening and that they are nearly translucent, but not entirely so. And we also have the fact that they are, at least the boy is a bit, uh, that the boy is in a bit of a murderous rage and the girl is just disturbed. She's a, she's a pitiful figure. A couple of things I'll add. One, they do seem to be tethered in some way to the locations of their bodies. That's the, the boy is in the cellar and that's where we get the rat noises. The girl is in the bath. We've encountered that. They do seem to also be making bird noises outside on the night, or maybe they actually are birds in some sense or, or spirits that act like birds in some way. And they also seem to be able to become corporeal, at least sometimes, because they do interact physically with Stephen and Mr. Abney. And I wondered about the about this becoming corporeal. Do you think that they have that ability on these dates because it's the anniversary of their murders? Or is it because of the, of the religious significance of the date upon which they've been murdered? I think it's more tied to the date of their murder. I think it's really tied to their, their being most disturbed on that day as these kind of psychic creatures. Now, to be clear, like, you know, this is, this is like a problem of the mind, right? They are ghosts. They are spirits. And their form they take, while may look corporeal, uh, and we have these long nails on the boy, we never see them interacting in the story with anything. It's just hinted at. And so we get this sense that though they may take corporeal form, and though they have characteristics of these, the claws that, that scrape and open the chest and murder, this all could be a case of the spiritual world interacting with the physical world, which really goes in, I think, into what this man, Mr. Abney, is trying to achieve metaphysically. How does, to, to gain a higher level of spirituality that gives him mastery over the physical world. And this is a really fun problem to think about, is how does the mind touch the world? And it's puzzling. We use our bodies, but maybe the ghosts don't have to. Maybe they can manifest certain things as they want. Because we don't get the sense that Stephen noticed or felt anything on his body. He just had a rough night sleeping. But he wakes up and he didn't hear scratching at his door, but he wakes up and all these marks are present. And I think that's a hugely important incident in the story. And I, I actually want to ask some questions about that too. You've already suggested, Brandon, that you think that 
the boy is trying to warn Stephen, and that's why there are the claw marks. I wonder about that, though. This seems pretty violent to me, and it's not clear that the kids are really trying to warn Stephen off. I had a hard time understanding their motivations in this story. I think it's meant to be a little unclear because you see that they do go after justice in some way. They do demand their own justice. And this is kind of the monkey's paw of Mr. Abney's wish is that human justice can't touch him. But as he's approaching this kind of final ascension, if you will, (laughs) the, the spiritual world is more open. He's more open to attacks from the spiritual world. I also had that question as well. It's very violent, but the kids at the window murder Mr. Abney before Stephen can get there, and they block Stephen from getting in. They don't want to s- him to see the murder, but they want the murderer revealed to him. And it's not a kind thing. It's not something you'd want a ch- another child to see. Yeah, I think that was my sense as well. That, that was a scene that James wanted to put in the story because it's spooky on its own and didn't really try very hard to stitch it together with the rest of the motives. But, you know, death of the author, so let's try to make sense of, of the text. And uh, I do think that there probably is something funny going on here with the fact that despite claw marks on his door and his pajamas the adults just tell Stephen to lock his door and close his windows and maybe to not tell anyone and i think perhaps that is james pointing out that none of those are good things to do that sometimes adults don't give you good advice that maybe you should take matters into your your own hands which Stephen does eventually on the you know uh, the next time he encounters these ghosts Stephen does take things into his own hands Right. Mrs. Bunch is also concerned with another kind of spiritual activity, which is prayer, that if he prays every night, he won't get hurt. And I think James is really making a strong point in the story to children that, yes, sure, say your prayers and do the spiritual stuff. But as you have a body, as you are in this material world, you can't just leave everything up to the spiritual. There are material actions. There is a necessity to interact with material, with bodies with matter. And we're going to come back to prayer and religion in just a second. But I want to ask you one more question about the ghost's motives and the ghost's behavior, which is why do they cut open Mr. Abney's chest, but then leave his heart? Uh, Certainly, I think I as a reader wanted the more poetical justice of his heart having been ripped out, not just opened and exposed. Well, this goes to my sense of the way that the mind or the spirit can interact with the physical world. Where would they carry it? Where would they put it? Where does the, where are the pockets in the mind where you can hide a heart and escape through the window? There's, there's a real question there that I think, yes, maybe the heart could have gone missing, but it's still a bit of matter. And the way that these purely spiritual forms are able to interact is not by, maybe they have some impact on matter, but they can't, carry it. They're not bodies in the same way. That's a really good point. The only thing that we see the ghosts doing in the physical world here in this story is destroying things. They seem to be able to alter things only to the extent of breaking them uh, into their constituent parts, into their the, in, in, breaking things down to the atomic level, perhaps, might actually be the way that a Neoplatonist thinker would have described that but they don't seem to be able to move things or to transform things or carry them from one place to another. I, I think that's a pretty shrewd observation. Well, on that note of Neoplatonist, I think it's time to really dig into what is going on with all of the late antique paganism here in this story. So let's talk about Mr. Abney's religion and let's talk about Mr. Abney as a villain. I'll do just a little bit of unpacking of all of these references. I'll put on my historian's hat for just a minute, and then I've got some questions about this. So the, the, the texts from the ritual, uh, these are Simon Magus, the Clementine Recognitions, and Hermes Trismegistus. All of these are from religion in the Roman world. Simon Magus is a figure in the New Testament. Uh, he appears in Acts uh, 8, uh, 9 through 24, and he's also mentioned in what James here calls the Clementine Recognitions. That text is ascribed to Pope Clementine, who was the successor to Peter in the early Roman Empire, so the, the second pope in Rome. But the text that he's talking about 
is not written by Clementine, and it actually dates from the 4th century, so 300 years later. Uh, And it's also written by an adherent to a form of Christianity that would today be called heretical. It would be not recognized as Christianity by anyone who claims to be a Christian today. Uh, And that text does actually contain the story that James says it does here, that, that Simon Magus uses the soul of a boy to perform magic in the world. And I want to dig in on that character just a little bit. In Acts, in in the Christian New Testament, uh, Simon is well known as a wizard, but when he sees the miracles of the apostles Philip, Peter, and John, uh, he decides that he wants to be a part of their new religion so that he can get the type of magic power that they have as well. Uh, He tries to buy their magic ability from them, right? He tries to buy their ability to work holy miracles, and and Peter chastises him for this, and he says, I'm going to quote here, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. And that, to me, seems to be a real big theme that's that's happening here in this story. But before we have a conversation about this, let me talk about Hermes Trismegistus for a minute. Uh, This is a generic name that gets attached to a number of religious and magical texts from late antiquity and the Middle Ages. As far as I know, none of them actually indicate that you can attain immortality by eating other people's hearts. Uh, But one of these texts, at least, is very concerned with questions of immortality and death. The same questions, the same things that Mr. Abney is really concerned with. And That particular text is extremely important to the work of Augustine, who is foundational in the development of the Christian intellectual tradition of late antiquity and is still important today. Most of the beliefs that Christians have today are really worked out by Augustine here in late antiquity. And he devotes a good chunk of uh, book eight of his uh, massive work, The City of God Against the Pagans, to pointing out where Hermes Trismegistus has gone wrong and where Christianity has the real answers to how we get to live forever. So with all of that in mind, what do you think James wants us to understand about the nature of Mr. Abney's villainy in this story? All of those three texts seem to point out the the crook in the path, the crookedness of the way to achieve um, the spiritual gifts that, you know, in M.R. James's world, only Christianity could provide, and in much of the New Testament and much of the text, many of the texts you cited, they also bear a superficial similarity to what early Christianity claimed to be able to do, what early Christians were doing, the the healing, the achieving special powers and magic and things like that, and viewed one way uh, from outside of Christianity in the in the early development of Christianity, these were traveling magicians in some way. They were able to perform miracles. And part of the reason why they were the apostles, I should say, are, were performing miracles was to demonstrate God's power. It was a way of proselytizing. There's another passage in James uh, in the New Testament that I think is worth looking at, which is uh, something to the effect of, and I paraphrase here, uh, true, relog- true religion lies in, in this, that you care for the widows and orphans. In this story, we have Mrs. Bunch, who is a missus, though she lives in the manor without a husband, and could be indicated here that she's a widow, and that Mr. Abney also has, for the past 20 years or so, been caring for these three orphans and looking for opportunities to care for orphans. This is a passage that I think uh, Mrs. Abney would have been familiar with, and speaks to her belief that Mr. Abney is a genuinely good man, that he cares for widows and orphans. And so I think what James is doing here is showing us the superficial practices of this man, um, his his ability to, through society, put on this mask by performing these acts that look very Christian, but behind the scenes is very crooked when the mask is off, that his intention with these actions is to hire uh, what James goes through some lengths to point out is a semi-unintelligent, superstitious, lower-class woman to 
run his house and she doesn't need to know his business and that she won't ask questions when orphans goes go missing because she has a lot of uh, prejudices about foreigners and about gypsies and about people in her culture that don't belong. So the questions are, of course they'd leave. They don't, they're not Christian like we are. They don't understand what, how good Mr. Abney is and what he's doing. So I think that this is that behind the doors, behind the mask of this activity of looking well in the eyes of the neighbors and what's going on. He doesn't bother his neighbors. They have no complaints. He's a good neighbor then in that account as well. But there's a real crook in the path and it's the same mistake that these other people are after, which is achieving power now um, through these dark, crooked means. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Mr. Abney is a perversion of Christianity. He's do- he, he is actually doing, as you point out, some charitable Christian things, but he's doing it so that he can murder people in order to get demonic, evil magic. And I, I think there's a sense in which Mr. Abney can be seen as the anti-Augustine or the inversion or perversion of the figure of Augustine. Augustine, as I already pointed out, knew these same pagan texts that Mr. Abney is working on. And in fact, knew more of them because they haven't all survived for Mr. Abney to be able to read. But Augustine was especially keen on Neoplatonism, which is mentioned very early on in Lost Hearts. And Neoplatonism was a school of philosophy in late antiquity that was very much concerned with the nature of souls and trying to understand how the universe functions. It was really interested in, in, in magic, though, as well. Right. And this is where you have the real question of the spiritual world interacting with the physical world. How does an ideal form go from that form in God's mind to being an object through what means of transmission does the kind of notion of the chair, the idea of a thing become a thing? Are people prophets? Is there a way to get more power? Are we clued into the mind of God? Is there a way to open up that more? Are we able then to create if we gain enough power with our minds? Are we able to make something physical that is purely spiritual? And these are the kinds of questions that Neoplatonism plays with. And Augustine really blends Neoplatonism with Christianity. He he disregards the Neoplatonists' paganism and a lot of their explanations for, uh, and a lot of their explanations about magic and about worship. But he takes their metaphysics, their worldview, their understanding of how the universe works, and applies it to Christianity, and really transforms uh, Christianity's own understanding of how the universe works whether or not salvation is going to be bodily or spiritual, what happens to us after we die. All of the things that Christians believe now are the result of this blending of Christianity and Neoplatonism. And Mr. Abney's doing that same work here. He's developed the same expertise in late antique paganism that Augustine has. He also has a Christian education because he's an Englishman in 1812. But he's gone the other way, right? Where Augustine has gotten it right, Mr. Abney has gotten it wrong, and and really we should see him as being Simon Magus, right? He's looking for power and magic instead of looking for God's gift. We've seen, you know, the silver is a part of Mr. Abney's ritual, which is up going on here in the Simon Magus story, as well as in Judas's betrayal of Christ. And it it strikes me that because Mr. Abney really ought to know better. In fact, that he does know better. Mr. Abney is the actual, the the real lost heart of this story, right? He has lost his goodness. He's lost his, the moral compass that he should have from knowing scripture. Yes, absolutely. He is the one who has entirely lost his way and lost society, lost community, and has decided in his mind that uh, when he achieves his ends, it won't he won't have to worry about uh, the fussiness of human laws and, and justice and the notion that you can, from reading a text, and this is another way the mind mysteriously works in the world, from reading mystical texts in the ancient world to murdering real children, it's a huge leap and it requires some real kind of mental gymnastics to get there. And as you pointed out earlier, 
Mr. Abney has forgotten that there is another type of justice. It is not merely human justice that he ought to be concerned about. And that's really his undoing here. So we've talked now about Mr. Abney as a villain. Let's talk a little bit about Stephen as a hero. What do you think Stephen's heroic arc is here? Or what type of hero would you classify him as? Well, I think he's explicitly presented in this story as a student, as a disciple. And he's willing to learn both from the low uh, in his culture. He, he is from a maybe higher station, but he spends all of his time with the lowly in the household and learns from them. He's not there to give them something. He's not there to provide them with anything. He is leaning on them for his own survival. And he is a humble character. And he recognizes that there's something off about Mr. Abney, which is why he asked the question. Um, we don't get much in Stephen's mind um, from this story. So we have to assume that the question came from some activity, from wondering about the temple at the end of the walk, the Laurel Walk, um, and about the spooky picture <laughs> hanging on the stairs, which might be just like a painting of a scene in Hamlet or something like <laughs> right. that. Um, but the fact that there's something that doesn't quite add up in this house. And so he's inquisitive and he knows how to ask the right questions and he's humble. And though the spiritual world is uh, calling out to him in some way, he takes action in the physical world. Yeah, I think that's right. Let me Let me ask you a different question just to kind of get at this another way. What is it about Stephen that lets him survive his time in Mr. Abney's home, but it, but these other two kids don't survive it? What is different about Stephen, if anything? Oh, I don't think anything's different about him. I think, I think we have this moment of kind of divine intervention. We know that 20 years have passed from when the first victim was taken and murdered to when Stephen arrives, that Mr. Abney has been at this for a long time. And maybe the first girl tried to do something to warn the boy 10 years later uh, or, or 15 years later or so, but she d she didn't have that, that rage and that ability to interact with the world through her powerful psychic revulsion of the act that killed her. Uh, I think when the boy joins, when they see this third victim come along, th that it is a spiritual intervention. It is a form of divine justice that Mr. Abney was dabbling in entirely the wrong sorts of things and it became his comeuppance. And th Stephen is a catalyst for the ghosts recognizing that they need to stop this from happening again. Yeah. I mean, we should be clear that the ghosts are the ones with the agency or at least seemingly with the agency here that Stephen is the beneficiary of their actions. But I was thinking about this in a, in a number of different ways. You know, one is if the, the, these ghost kids are going to intervene at this moment to protect Stephen and to take their vengeance, why doesn't the girl do that when the Italian boy is a, in the same position as Stephen? There's no way of knowing that she didn't because we don't know that boy's experience. But she may have called out to him in the dream in the same way and he just didn't pick up on it. We, we know that the girl is really presented as more of a pitiful figure covered in a shroud, her hands over her heart. It calls to to mind for me like an image of the of the Pieta, like a like a, a nurturing mother figure, her hand over her heart for her child, for for her own loss, you know, or for the mourning what is to come in some way that she just doesn't have that level of disturbance that allows her to make this impact in the world. I think when they're together and they see it happening again is when we get the real vengeance. That's a real interesting reading of the text because I think we can actually see there that the girl here might be a figure of mercy and the boy here is a figure of vengeance. And these are the two conflicting yet also somehow compatible attributes of God in Judaism and in Christianity. And that perhaps the only way for Mr. Abney to get his true comeuppance is for both of those attributes to be together. That mercy, the figure, the ghostly figure of mercy is not going to do anything to Mr. Abney. But if we only had the ghostly figure of vengeance, then that's all it would be is vengeance and not justice, that vengeance without mercy 
is not true justice. I think that's an excellent point and a great abstraction of what, what I was saying. <laughs> well, I've got a couple other readings of this. I'm not really sure I buy into any of them, but I'm going to throw them out there and then invite listeners to, to chime in on the forum. And I don't know, we'll see what you have to say about them as well, Brandon. I guess I already hinted at the sort of class reading of what sets Stephen apart. He is the only one of these three kids who's actually not from the lower class himself. He is presented as being more clever than uh, th- than the two lower class housekeepers who he interacts with, which is funny. Um, but James also is existing in a world in which these class assumptions uh, are are real. And so I do think there might be a reading there that what sets Stephen apart from these other kids is that he has the benefit of having uh, an upper class upbringing. Right. And really the idea is, is that his loss of life would be a meaningful loss of life for society, that, he, that it's really the loss of potential and promise. Whereas with these two kids, even in the story, they're perfect archetypes, but not people. I think you've really convinced me that I think there's there's probably a better reading of this. And I do think that religion is really what's setting Stephen apart here. Because you've pointed out repeatedly that Stephen prays, and he's concerned about being good, uh, his own goodness, but also the goodness and the salvation of other people around him. I think it's also really significant that Stephen's the only one of these three kids who's going to be murdered during Holy Week. And I think that that is not accidental. I think that's extraordinarily significant. But thinking about your observations about the ghost, Brandon, I actually wonder if their ability to become corporeal at this time is not something they do every year on the anniversary of their death or on the pagan New Year or the the medieval Christian New Year, actually, we should say. I wonder if they're not here in answer to Stephen's prayers. Has he brought the justice of God to Mr. Abney through his own holiness. Yeah, there's nothing in the story that would contradict that reading. Well, I think we can invite listeners to meet that challenge and tell us where we've gone wrong. But with that in mind, I think we, we've beaten this one to death. We have ripped the still beating heart out of this question. <laughs> so uh, so let's move on to the final category. And this is, this is not one we need to spend a whole lot of time on, uh, but it is knowledge. Now, as you've already brought up, a real staple of weird fiction is that the quest for knowledge ultimately leads to one's own undoing and and sometimes even to the undoing of everything. And we certainly have that here in the character of Mr. Abney, whose life and and also his afterlife uh, would have been much better if he'd taken up badminton or baking or instead of scholarship. And I don't think we need to belabor that point here. We're going to get plenty of stories in the future to really dig in on that. But there is something I do want to talk about, and that is uh, a scholarly article that I read in preparation for today called The Toad in the Study. Uh, In this article, scholar Simon McCullough suggests that Stephen's story on lost hearts is also about the price of knowledge, right? It's not just Mr. Abney's story is about the price of knowledge, but Stephen's story also is wrapped up in that. What he argues is that the emotional core of the story is the effect upon Stephen's view of human nature and society. So the question I have is really just, do you think that's true? Does Stephen lose his innocence and perhaps even something of his humanity during the course of these events? It's hard to say if he loses something of his humanity. I think uh, the narrator is very careful to leave that question to the reader to determine. But I think it is a question that is raised in the text because we do know that we do learn that Stephen does go to these uh, to the library and reads these texts, and at some point is a, of an age to understand them. the The point of the narrator's break into the action of this story is to give distance between what. Stephen finds and when he understands what he found uh, in Mr. Abney's death, I absolutely think that Stephen pays a dear price for his curiosity. This is a major theme of the story as well, is Stephen's what's called courageous burst into the disused bathroom where he could have found a corpse of a girl that, that had clearly been moved, or but her spirit remained there. His insistence on answering getting answers to questions that maybe he doesn't need to know. And finally, his reading of his uncle's papers that are extremely disturbing. And they're presented in a sort of like, hey, I'm just doing this thing. It's fine, right? <laughs> like He's the only... Mr. Abney is his own reader. He's his own audience. So Stephen is also the one who discovers the body. And it, that must be extraordinarily traumatic. 
So yes, I do think that's a really kind of fair reading of this story. That's the knowledge Stephen finds out. His thirst for knowledge also comes at a price. One of the things that McCulloch really points out in this article is that Stephen is being shown that the adult world is not good, that adults are dumb or incompetent or or both, that oftentimes their primary motive is their own laziness, their own comfort, and that sometimes they're just outright evil and might murder some little kids. And, and discovering that about the adult world is, is really crucial to his reading of this story as being about the, the loss of innocence and the price of knowledge. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think there's no doubt in my mind that Stephen came of age in this episode in his life. I find this really interesting because I, I think I'm not sold on it. I, I mean, I certainly see that these points are all there. All these beats are all there. I actually really feel like this is a story about how Stephen is presented with these facts and overcomes it, that he almost retains his innocence and his purity. And I think that if we're going to read the ghosts as the answer to Stephen's prayers, then I wonder if we shouldn't actually see that Stephen is retaining his innocence and his purity and his goodness, despite the fact that he is being confronted with the fact that the world itself is a harsh and often vile place. I think it's explicit in the text that this is not the exact moment where Stephen loses his innocence as a result of knowledge gained. It is explicit in the text that this is knowledge that he, when he comes of age, he is able to understand. So there is a connection here between this knowledge and understanding of the adult world. But I think you're right that Stephen, it, it is the way it's written. It does point to the fact that Stephen overcomes this, but he returns to it to get understanding. And I, I just want to read out loud what the, when the narrator breaks in what he says, so we can just get a clear study. So, so Stephen is finally able to break through the door and the narrator breaks in. And what he says is this on the table in Mr. Abney's study, certain papers were found, which explained the situation to Stephen Elliott when he was of an age to understand them. And so I think that that speaks really to your, your reading and critique of this uh, article of the story. Well, I think what we really need is a series of sequels to this story in which Stephen is an adult and has become a, a monster hunter or a, a wizard hunter of some sort. Living in some trailer in Lincolnshire, <laughs> addicted to booze, trying to figure out what went wrong. And then he breaks back into Azerby Hall before it gets destroyed and finds his uncle's papers. Yeah, I think that's the exact plot of Hellblazer, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, I think that's going to do it for this episode. I'm Glenn McDorman. And I'm Brandon Buddha. You can find us and our other creative projects, as always, at claytemplemedia.com. And really, check out Agnes, uh, our Clay Temple's podcast on all things late antique and medieval. Head on over to the Clay Temple Forum and let us know what you thought of this story. Let us know whether you think that Stephen has lost his innocence, retained his innocence. Let us know what you think the ghost boy was up to in attacking Stephen. Yeah, I'd love to hear our listeners and readers' thoughts on this story. It's a fun one. Next time, we'll be reading Lucy Comes to Stay by Robert Block. But until then, we greet you and say farewell. <laughs>